reputation and how do you get a plus clients now before we get started um, some of you going to hear some things maybe for the first time some of you are going to hear some things that you have heard about before some of this stuff may not be new to you but I want to tell you this that unless you are doing the things that I talk about this afternoon then you really don't know it and, and I like to kind of give you a, a little example of that Everybody in this room and your clients all know that you should be backing up your data. Everybody knows that, right? Mm -hmm. But if you do not back up your data and your system crashes and you start crying about how you lost your data, you only know about backing up your data. You don't know that you back up your data. Do you understand that? No. So it's you got to be doing the things that you know you should be doing them doing or you really don't know them. So, uh, why am I qualified to talk to you on this topic of getting an A-plus reputation and, and getting A-plus clients? Well, I spent a lot of years in sales and marketing. The bulk of my career was sales and marketing. And I specialized in winning really top-notch uh, customers away from our competitors. And it's not an easy thing to do because it's a painful process for a client, especially a really good client, to move to another vendor, to move to another company. It's not something that they do just because you show up at their doorstep, knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here, I want your business. They won't move unless they see that they either need to move or that you're actually better than what they are currently getting from their suppliers. So I've been in the, uh, the, the internet uh, game, I'll call it, since the early uh, 90s. Uh, I've, uh, before that, was in the printing industry, and I sold digital printing. I, and, and our company was one of the largest multimedia companies in Western Canada. I'm from Canada, by the way. Yay, Canada. Uh, <laughs> Our company was a good one. I had good people doing good work. That that was a real bonus of benefit to me because I could just go out there and represent, you know, good quality work. And uh, that's key. If you're not really good, there's no point in you knocking on doors of top-notch customers. And uh, we we moved and transitioned from print media to digital print media to multimedia. I was selling. Um, e-commerce system so way back before a lot of people really understood what the e-commerce systems were all about as a matter of fact when i got started in the industry uh was around the time when it was still somewhat practical to actually map out the internet on a map <laughs> can you believe it this was a uh, a map that was in a magazine about the internet and all of the top relevant uh, internet uh, places could be put on a map like this, or like the map of the United States. This was the map of the internet. Of course, that would be a ridiculous thing to try and do today, but back then, it was pretty simple. And uh, when I got involved in the internet, most people, the general population, thought the internet was protected environments like CompuServe and America Online, you know, those little protected communities where they kind of put data in there. And, and I hung around with the scary people that went out on the unknown internet. And, uh, and for most people, they didn't clue in that CompuServe or America Online wasn't the internet until, you know, maybe a couple of years later. So I've been uh, out there dealing with customers, helping people to understand uh, digital media. 
one of the things that we could say about this presentation, we could we could have called this presentation, Don't You Want to Love What You Do and Who You Do It For? Really, everybody in this room, you got to spend so much time working. Don't you want to love what you do and who you're doing it for, right? So I'm going to start off now by making this statement. The A-plus clients are looking for you. The A-plus clients are looking for you if you are really good at what you do and you have a good reputation, they are looking for you. And I can say this from experience because I was on the client side for a period of time when uh, Joomla had just become Joomla, just transitioned from Mambo to Joomla. I was on the client side and I was busy uh, putting an enterprise system together for a national association. And I went into the open source world to take a look around and see what was out there because the enterprise piece, uh, the, the, it was a system from Chicago by a company called Go Members. It was called DMG4, it was a Microsoft based product, and it was very, very expensive. And the, this it was an old product and it didn't actually have a web interface. That part of it was actually completely customized and all the other parts of the enterprise system were modules that were from the DMG4 system. And uh, I, when I started looking around at open source, I, I saw Joomla and I went, wow, you know what? This could actually replace pieces of this enterprise system and do a really, really good job right out of the box, a whole lot cheaper than the money that we were spending to create this environment ourselves. So uh, I had a budget. We were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this enterprise system. So I had a budget for the web piece. And I thought, Joomla is cool. And then I couldn't find anybody that did it, that was near me, that could be my vendor. I even tried waving, you know, I have a budget, because, you know, and it still didn't help me. And it wound up that it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for me because what happened is it forced me to learn Joomla. And I never dreamed back then that I would actually be earning my living with Joomla as a large part of what I did. So when I was looking for help, I couldn't find it. It's a bit different today, but it's still hard. There's still, in the market that I'm from, there's still not a lot of people that are known to be really, really good at this piece. So the A-plus clients, the ones that want the experts, they're looking for the best people in the, uh, the business. So they're looking for you. But what are they gonna do? How will they find you? if you're spending your time with the clients from hell. <laughs> this is true. They find will not be able to find you if you're spending time with the clients from hell. Let's talk a little bit about what is an A-plus client. An A-plus client, this is subjective, an A-plus client means different things to different people. It may mean that uh, it's somebody that pays their bills on time. It may be that it's somebody that actually respects what you do. It may be a person that's easy to work with. It might be somebody that's, you know, bits and pieces of all of that. It's different for different people. But I will tell you that there are some attributes of an A-plus client that you need to understand. Is that they are people that want you to be successful too. They are people that want you to be profitable. They want you to go long term. They want you to be there for them long term. You see, because they're successful and they want to be there long term, so that's one of the attributes of an A-plus client. They're going to treat you really, really well. If this all sounds foreign to you, you do not have A-plus clients. All right, you got that? So an A-plus client, contrast it. What is a client from hell? Well, the client from hell is an individual that thinks their dollar is worth $100 and that uh, believe unreasonable things about you and think that we're, from where you come from, you're a dime a dozen and can be replaced just like that. And all kinds of other things. And, and we'll hear some more about this as we go along. So the A-plus clients are, are looking for you. But we got to talk about you a little bit first because the A-plus client, they deserve 
and A plus spenders and uh, people with good reputation, which means you need to earn the right to have A plus clients. And you can do this at the onset of your business. You don't have to do work for major corporations and big clients to de develop or, or to establish your reputation. You just need to do and establish it and be consistent and get that reputation. So let's talk a little bit about you first. If you do not value your worth, why should you climb? If you don't value what you do, neither will your client. You know, this is a really interesting industry. It moves fast and it has a, a steep and ongoing learning curve. Think about how many other professions are there where they have to constantly upgrade their skills. They have to qualify for keeping their professional designations. The kinds of people I'm thinking are about, you know, accountants, uh, how about lawyers, uh, certain parts of the medical industry. They all work hard, but don't you? You work hard too. What, well, let's see what you bring to the table here. You need to know HTML, CSS, have design sense and know specialized software, JavaScript, Ajax, PHP, MySQL, know about web servers, do project management, you know, need to know social media, mobile, it's all about responsive, <laughs> HTML5, and it's enough to make your head explode. Do you have value? And, and you should respect your value. You know, they want professionals, they want professionals with a good reputation. But who determines your reputation? How do you manage that? What do you do? Do you go out and you hire a public relations firm to establish your reputation? How does this work? Well, actually it's really simple. There's two sources from where your reputation comes from, either yourself or someone else. It's as simple as that. And uh, I'm saying, what has more clout? Which has more credibility? You saying that you're great and wonderful? How, how many of us all put you know, great big accolades on our website that, uh, ooh, we're the greatest, we do this, nobody does it better, all that stuff sounds like a song, right? And people go to the website, they read it, and, you know, and, and they don't even know if it's uh, you or somebody that you hired to write it, and even if there's a name there, maybe they don't know what that name is. I'm going to show you a little video about uh, what I'm talking about here. Who determines your reputation, you or somebody else? I am the greatest. So here he is, screaming, I am the greatest. That's who? Him or somebody else? an article by a guy named Tom Watts, I believe, from a, a boxing specialty. Out of his article, he makes this statement. There is no doubt, there is no doubt that Muhammad Ali is the greatest boxer of all time.
piece that's on the internet right now is from a blog article by one of my clients who is a very, very avid social media blogger and he is the marketing manager, European marketing manager uh, for an international technology company. And instead of doing Follow Friday, you know, where he puts a bunch of uh, Follow Friday and a bunch of people's Twitter things and publish them on Friday, what he does is he puts up a link and he says, here's my perpetual Follow Friday list. And he points people to a page that has a list of names of people and he puts a little blurb there about what he thinks about those people. And he says here, without any shadow of a doubt, Joe is the best <coughs> Joomla consultant in all of Canada. If you use Joomla for your website and you needed to do something you thought wasn't possible or just do a much better job of the things you knew it was capable of, Joe is your man. In addition to wrangling websites, Joe is a brilliant trainer and can turn you into a Joomla superhero. Rumors that he is able to leap tall buildings in a single bound are, however, unfounded. Mm -hmm. This is where my reputation comes. It comes from other people. It comes from earning it by doing a good job and by doing some of the other things that I'm going to talk about here uh, in the next little while to get someone to see it. <coughs> but I can guarantee you that there's somebody in this room right here that this will make angry. Uh, there Canadian Joomla consultant. There's one right in the back. <laughs> Is he angry? He's giving it to me. Is he here? <laughs> but you will not be able to convince, and, and I've been uh, in conversations with this client with other vendors in um, um, Google Hangouts and video conferences, and, and he continues to rave <coughs> about how he, and he took it to the next level. He said, not only do I think that Joe is the best consultant in Canada, I think he may be the best consultant in the world. <coughs> I'm sure not. that's gonna make some people angry. <laughs> but, the, but the point that I'm making is this, is that this is what he perceives or believes about me because of some very simple, fundamental things that I have done and been consistent with him over time. We didn't sign it. Joe's there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? So somebody said to me, to, uh, to get a good reputation, all you have to do is put your name in front of the Joomla brand. Joe Joomla. Right? Well, you know what? Betty Joomla, Bobby Joomla, Jenny Joomla, they're all available. Go for it. And then let me know how that's working for you later on. It's not as simple as that. A good reputation and good clients will keep you in the game. And this is a game, indeed. It's a long-term <coughs> game. Because if you have lousy clients, you won't go the distance. You will not finish the race. You will burn out. This is a really fun industry. It's moving. It's exciting. And it's a long distance journey. And you're not going to finish this race if you burn out. So we need to talk just a little bit about what is burnout. And what burnout is... of doing it. Here's the first way. This is the fun way, is that you sit on a beach and you enjoy the sun and the water and the scenery and consume beverages and spend all your money and eventually you will go broke. Now, I don't know too many people that are actually practicing this right now. <laughs> Trust me. But on the other hand, the Silicon Valley, there's a few. 
On the other hand, there's another way of going broke, and what it is is it's working yourself 18 hours a day, seven days a week, having no life, hating the way things are going, not making enough money, and burning out, and eventually you go broke, or you get out of the game. And, and not only that, this is something that I want to uh, really, really uh, impress upon you, that uh, the A-plus clients, they have a life, they have families, and they go places, they have vacations, uh, they work out, they get involved in the culture, they're interesting people, and when you go, you know, and, and entertain them and have dinner, uh, they have interesting things to talk about, and it's not always business. But if all you're doing is sitting in front of your computer working nonstop, uh, you're not very interesting, and why would they want to hang out with you? Your A-plus clients are people that are reasonable. If you have a balanced life, guess what? If you're married, the most important asset that you own is your spouse or uh, your partner and your family because they bring life to you. They give you joy. If you are not a happy person, you are a person that's no fun to be around. You need to be able to have great clients, and guess what, they respect this. They know that uh, uh, everything's not a big emotional crisis. They live in a world where problems or opportunities, as a lot of them are called, are just simply acts of life, things that happen along the way, and they run into this, and they're all top-notch people, they get paid well, and what happens, they go, oh, we got to come together and we need to fix this, to solve this situation, and they do it all in a calm fashion, and their vendors and their suppliers, they all work with them in a calm fashion, not in a freak-out fashion, so keep little mental notes here, the clients from hell, they freak out a lot. The A-plus clients know that things happen, and they have you, and you're really good at what you do, and together you are going to solve the problem, create new opportunities, uh, fix things, and have success stories along the way. And uh, this is a really, really important thing. You need to be a healthy, happy, content person and not somebody that's working themselves to death and not having any fun. But occasionally we wind up with a client from hell. What do you do when that happens? Well, somewhere along the way, this client heard you or thought they heard you say yes to all of their unreasonable expectations. They believe that you agreed to give it to them for this price, at this time, for that quality. And if your idea of what the agreement was is completely different than theirs, there's a real uh, bad vibration going on between you. And so what do you do when you have a client that is now making your life miserable and they are, and this has a domino effect. It affects your other clients as well too, and that's not fair. Your other customers, especially your other good customers, don't deserve a train wreck to be doing their work. They deserve somebody that's in control, that's balanced, that's having a good life. And then suddenly you've got this problem. What you need to do when you have the client from hell and, and they're not being reasonable, uh, you then need to end the relationship, and you should try and end the relationship amicably. Don't just fire the client, you know, in a fit of emo. If you're a professional, get yourself in, in a position where you look and see, okay, I promised that I would fulfill these obligations, do it, and then end the relationship. And if they're surprised, just say, I'm sorry, I'm no longer available to do your work because that person is going to make it difficult for you to wind up with A-plus clients. You'll see more about what I mean uh, as we go along here. <coughs> so you need to clarify your agreements. They need to understand exactly what the arrangement is and what the relationship is. I have a great story. 
uh, from my past here for you. And this really happened. I was doing some work with a marketing uh, <coughs> manager, a lady who owned a marketing company, and she, uh, she, she was very successful, but she had a hobby and she loved to do uh, landscape painting. And this was something that you know gave her joy and it took her mind off of her work. So she would wind up doing a series of landscape paintings and she would pick a theme. And this particular time she picked a theme of painting farms in Canada, farm operations. So the landscapes with the farm house and the, the buildings and you know the barns and, and beautiful, uh, impressive, great looking farm operations. And she thought, I'm gonna have a show. I'm going to sell some of these paintings. And so she did what marketers do. She got a venue and she invited a whole bunch of people to come out. And the room was full of people looking at these paintings and they were really good. And a very well-dressed gentleman uh, from the other side of the country approached this young lady. She was like in her late 20s at the time. And he said, I'm really white. Your work. This is really impressive. He said, I would like to hire you to take my farm. And he says, uh, but I'm on the other side of the country. He says, but I'm willing to fly you out and cover all of your expenses and, um, and everything that you need for the whole duration, the whole time that you require during the duration of this project. And so she told him, okay, well, this is how much I charge to, you know, to do uh, paint the farm. And uh, they made an agreement. And so he goes, you know, back to where he's from. And in the agreed time slot, he uh, mails her, her flight tickets, first class airplane tickets. She flies all the way across the other side of the country. She is met at the airport by this uh, farmer's driver. He was, it was a big farm operation, very successful. And they drive for a couple of hours because he's way out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, they meet the, you know, the farm owner. Uh, they have uh, a meal together and they just shoot the breeze. And then he says to her, Okay, so uh, I'd like to, to get you on, you know, the all-terrain vehicle. We're going to take you around the property so you get an idea of the scope and, the, you know, the feel of it. He was very proud. And, and, and uh, so on the uh, all-terrain vehicle they go, and as they're going, he's showing them the building, telling her what the machinery does, introducing her to the people that work there. And then uh, at a certain point, you know, he looks at his watch, he says, you know, we're farmers. And, uh, we got to make the best of the sunshine. So we get up at the crack of dawn. So uh, we're going to pack it in early. And we want you to, you know, get a, an early start in the morning. Um, you know, make hay while the sunshine, so to speak. So we'll take you back to uh, and show you where your quarters are. But before we go there, he drove over to this big shed. He said, uh, I just want to show you where your supplies are, you know, so in the morning you can get a start. And he opens up the doors of this big shed, and suddenly they're looking at uh, several 50 gallon drums of red barn paint, ladders, and paint brushes. <laughs> and it, it was at this moment in time that this young lady realized that this gentleman had literally hired her to paint her farm. <laughs> and she never dreamed that when they were at the gallery and he was looking at these paintings that she did, she never dreamed that he would think that these were all farms that he literally painted around the country. True story. What did she do? She didn't say a word. She swallowed her pride. She got up early the next morning, went out to the thing, got the paint, got the ladders. She painted this man's farmhouse and fulfilled her obligations and made sure that in the future that she was a lot more clear about what she wow. does. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to talk to Statement of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. I want to talk a little bit about business killing mistakes. And uh, these are all things that come from experience over the years. 
and some of them are, are very obvious. Term property for your professional services. Uh, I call this uh, you know, presentation secrets of getting an A plus reputation and A plus client. So here's one of the secrets. You might want to just make it out of this. The clients from hell are attracted like a bug is to like to low prices. They that's if you price yourself low, too low, you are literally asking for the clients to hell to find from hell to find you. If you price yourself properly, you tend to avoid most of the clients from hell. That's a big, big tip. Now, what does it mean, charge properly? What does that mean? Yeah, that was my well, question. Again, this is something else that's subjective. I'm, I'm amazed at how many people who get into the business, they say, what should I be charging? How much should I charge? How much do you charge? You know, you know and they're, then they're trying to find a number. And, you know, most business people kind of have a mathematical formula that they can follow that, you know, considers their overhead and all their expenses and, and works at a profit. And they kind of know where they need to be priced because they know how much, how many man hours they have and what they need. Well, keep it simple. The right way to charge is that you need to be satisfied that you are getting what you need for the lifestyle that you want. That's the easy way of doing it. You must be happy with the living that you are making. Otherwise, you need to make a change. You need to make an adjustment, or you need to go and do something else if you can't figure out how to be happy. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, small operation. They uh, only have so many hours, but if they have to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week in order to pay their bills, that's not a good business model. And the A plus clients don't want you. They want professionals. And it's a uh, known thing that if you are underpriced, they think something's wrong. Oh, this guy's on the learning curve or whatever, right? They'll want you messing with my work because, you know, I just paid X number of dollars to get this done from this other profession and you're like getting yourself away here. Hmm, you're probably not in the same class as the other person. So one of the things that you do along the way as you're building your business, again, you're building your business, you're building your reputation. And in the beginning, you don't have as many choices or as many uh, uh, times that you can say, no, I'm not doing your work. A lot of times you just have to take the work that comes in in order to get going. So as you are doing this, as you are doing your work and building up your business, even when your business is successful, you still need to do this thing. It's called evaluate your account. And you need to be smart about it because the account that you bill the largest number at the end of the month may not be your best customer. Do the math and figure out that the number of hours for how much you are charging and then you could find out you're making less than minimum wage, that is not your best customer. You may discover that you're doing smaller projects that are much more highly profitable and that this other person that's chewing up all your time, even though you're building, building the largest uh, volume of dollars, is actually hindering your business from moving forward. So very, very important. So you evaluate your account and you do this and you always replace the bottom account. You always look at your client list. You know how many customers that you can handle. Now, there are some businesses that are, are, are very fundamentally different than, say, ongoing clients. But when I, I have clients that I have retainers for, and they retain me for, you know, uh, this many hours a month, and if they need more, they buy more. Like I have all these different kinds of clients. If you only have like you know the the you know you sell it once and you're gone, uh, we're not talking about that. That's a whole different business model. But I'm talking about when you have a client base that you are ongoing and actively uh, looking after. You evaluate them and you always replace the bottom one, unless you will have a full client list of all A-plus clients, and you're happy as heck with each and every one of them, they all treat you well, and they all pay you properly, you replace the bottom one. But there's an exception to this. You've got to have fun at what you do. 
so when i was building my business in the sales industry, you know in the communications industry i was adding better clients over time and i had to free up time in order to do what it takes to do the marketing and the promotion to position myself to get those other clients that i wanted. i literally targeted clients that i want that one, this would be a good one for our company, i'd love to work for them and well if you're busy all the time you can't do what it takes to get yourself in front of those people so you need to make time. the way you make time is you literally make time. this one's taking up time, it's not as profitable, i'm going to put it aside and then i'm going to spend time wooing you and i'm going to spend time wooing you. Would it be easy just to hire somebody else I'm to work with you? Well, that's another you. thing that you can do as well, too. But still, there's only so much production you got. I'll probably answer the question somewhere along the line. So we'll hold the questions till the end. And uh, But I'm here for the question. Uh, keep some that make you feel good. Why do I say that? It's because, hey, you got to have fun, too. So for example, uh, I was building client lists. And suddenly, I'm dealing with major corporations and big clients billing you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, in a month and for one client. And uh, and then there was this one little customer that I had, you know, it was one of the first ones I got. And I get about two projects a year from this person. But every time we got together, we laughed. Every time we got together, we had fun. She made me, you know, feel great. It was a breath of fresh air. And I treated her like one of my top customers. And you know, because she was literally one of my best promotional mouthpieces. This person was very popular in the industry and was running around all over the place telling everybody that she knew how great I was. And uh, I kept that one. But you can't afford to have customers that aren't taking you where you need to go. This is a great uh, bit of advice for you. Get yourself a uh, board of advisors. I was asked by a software development company, a startup actually, if I would be on the board of advisors. And what this gentleman did is he found somebody. I was just uh, from the sales industry. He found somebody from the financial industry. He got somebody who was uh, from a successful company that was a production manager. He got lawyers. He got different disciplines who once a month would get together and he would offer them a lunch. And uh, he had put out ahead of time before the camp the one question uh, that was daunting him that he was needing you know, professional advice from. And it wasn't always relevant to every part, every sector of the advisory group. So people would come out anyways and just then you always gain great information. You might not be able to afford to have people on your advisory board that you pay, but you would be surprised at how many people are willing to, if they like you, to offer you their advice for free. You need to ask. My uh, buddy list, a little Skype list, is what I look at, and it's a major board of advisors list. I don't spend a lot of time with people on Skype. Uh, they're all professionals. I respect their time, and uh, and they're all. If you looked at my buddy list, you would see the who's who in June on my buddy list, you would see other people there that you would recognize their names. And you'd go, wow, I'd love to be able to talk to that person. You know what? They're willing to talk to me. But I also have a, an advisory board that uh, are people who um, are, w and they're all around the world, and we get together virtually and we share because they want knowledge that I have to be imparted <coughs> to them. And they have knowledge that is going to really benefit and help me. And you have to be willing to listen to their advice and take it very, very seriously. Because if you don't take their advice, if you don't do what they said you should be doing, why are they on your board of advisors? Right? They're either not smart enough to be on it because you don't think their advice is very good, then get somebody on there that <coughs> got advice that's really, really valuable to you. So get a board of advisors. Here's a great one. Do not use inefficient equipment. <coughs> I am absolutely amazed that people who call themselves professionals that have computer equipment 
that's uh, three, four generations old, and they're trying to still stretch out some life in this baby. And uh, I have been guilty of this uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years. I was in Chicago, and I, I use Macintosh equipment because my background is design, basically. I'm from the design advertising community. And uh, the two people that I was talking to were, were you know, encouraging me to get involved in the Joomla community, go to Joomla and Beyond, you know, in Germany, you know, you know, which happened last spring. And I noticed that the one uh, lady was uh, working on her power book, and it was going three times faster than mine was. I'm going, whoa, I feel sketchy. This is really bad. I'm thinking, if any of my clients found out that I was using equipment that I had to sit there and wait and twiddle my thumbs for it to catch up with my skills, they'd be wondering, why are you, I'll buy you a computer. You're doing my work, you know? And uh, so I, I just said, uh, wake up, get some uh, equipment. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I was hired by a, a huge multimedia company in Western Canada, and it's the guy who's taking me through the tour of the building. We're walking by, and uh, he points to this workstation. He says, I paid $17,000 for that monitor. And I went, what? Why would you pay $17,000 for a monitor? He says, oh, he says, I make the most money from this workstation here. I have my best person here, and this person's able to see a double page spread and and makes four this workstation makes four or five times the amount of money that any other workstation in the building does. So for him, he saw this as a competitive advantage. He was a guy that told me, when you buy equipment, never buy low, he says, because the next generation of equipment comes out and yours is really obsolete. He says, you don't necessarily have to buy at the very, very top, but if you buy near the top, even when the next one comes out, it's nowhere near, like if you were buying at the bottom. Uh, he spent good money for good tools. All right, so think about this. Let's say you need to go to the hospital and the surgeons are gonna work on you. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of money, so they're using butter knives. <laughs> right? And uh, they're kind of sort of, you know, stretch the budget a little bit. And, and they're using equipment and things to look after you that you, you realize are, what am I doing here? Think about that. Do not use inefficient equipment. You will also enjoy what you do a lot more when you have great working equipment. And, uh, you know, you can always find use for this, this thing here. It's got a lifespan of whatever. The, the minute I know that uh, I need a faster machine, I'm looking. If I can't afford to buy one, am I charging enough? Do I have the, am I in the right business? And don't use an efficient equipment. Do not do what you are not good at. Now, this is a particularly tough area for people that are just starting out in the business. Um, they think they have to do everything themselves. That's not true. If you start doing things that you are not good at, your reputation will sink. You get a good reputation by doing good work. But it's not you that has to do everything. Think about it. Your customers hire you to do their website. They're not doing it themselves, right? If they did everything themselves, they do the website themselves too. Instead, they hired you. But of all the things that are in the website, um, great design, PHP, JavaScript, all, all of that complexity, they all combine together to make one thing. And you're the guy selling it to them. And it's okay if you go and hire this one, and you hire that one, and you hire that one to do it. As far as your customer is concerned, you're the one that provided the services and the goods. And your reputation will skyrocket the better each part of the disciplines are, the better you are. And that goes into your reputation. So do not do what you are not good at. You don't have to be the best coder or the best designer to have the best client. You just simply need to be able to solve problems for people. That's why they hired you.
that's why that gentleman who says Joe is the best junior consultant in all of Canada, is because you see when he knows him and he calls me that he's not expecting Joe to do everything. He just knows that if Joe doesn't do it himself, Joe will go and find the appropriate person to do it at the level that it needs to be done at. And he appreciates that. He knows that's what's happening. So make sure that you solve problems for people. That's why they hired you. And as long as you keep that straight, if you're going 20, you know, I learned this lesson. I sweat for uh, a couple of days to try and, and do this one little piece. And it was driving me nuts. And then what happens is that your disposition sinks. You start getting, uh, you lose your confidence. You start getting depressed. You no longer like what you're doing. <coughs> and then suddenly I called the guy. And at the guy that I called who uh, was at the time the lead developer for the Juno project. Mm -hmm. And I talked to him. I said, this is driving me absolutely nuts. He says, well, well, why are you doing it? He says, go over here and do this, get this part, and, and just replace that whole thing with this. And I went, and I took his advice, <coughs> and it was like, boom, in 20 minutes, the problem was over, and it was solved. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, what was I thinking? What was I doing? I don't need, you don't need to do everything. You just need to be able to go and figure out how to get the help that you need. If you're not doing that, you really don't know it. You only know about it. Can you benefit from competitors who compete on price? Absolutely, yes you can. Because when they get jammed up with low paying work, they remove themselves from the marketplace and they leave you and you can come in the prices that you deserve. We did a quote, as a matter of fact, uh, I did a quote, uh, and my good friend from Canada, Alan, was in on this quote, and we looked at this project, it was fairly complex, and, um, you know, and I thought, I'm not going to do all these things, I need this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, and so we combined together to put together a proposal, and it was done realistically, and it was done by professionals, and then we submitted the proposal, and it got rejected. And the guy went with a, a lower price. So fine, we put a lot of work into the, the quote, but we didn't get it. And then several months later, Thank I get an email from the guy that went somewhere else, and he sent me a link. Check out the website that got done by the other guys. And it was really interesting. The first place I looked at it was on my iPad. And when I went there, I, all I saw on the above the the fold on my iPad was just this big blank box, and I thought, oh, Screenshot. okay, <coughs> you know, I kind of scrolled, right I scrolled, of them. scrolled a little bit, and I'm looking, and you know, the rest of it was okay. So you know, I just sent him a quick email, and I said, uh, you know, I looked at your site, it looks nice. They said, so oh, by the way, you know, you might want to have a look at this. There's like, you know no, I knew it was flash, there's like no video or whatever it is that's in that great big space at the top of your site. Then he sends me an email back and he says, oh yeah, he says, there have been problems. <laughs> and that's when he goes, would you be able to help me? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not available for you to do <laughs> your work. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you can benefit from the uh, people that can, you know, Skills and talent uh, is very necessary, but there's something that trumps them every time. And what it is that trumps people, uh, trumps these two things, is honesty. Honesty. Uh, a guy, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Don't worry, don't okay. worry. I'm, I'm counting. A guy that uh, was in the communications industry on the client side for 27 years as a professional, and he said this to me, he says, in the whole 27 years that I've been in the business, I only ever met two people that were completely honest with me and had integrity. He says, and you were one of them. And then he named the other guy, and I knew who the other guy was. And I thought, wow, 27 years. Well, why is that? 
The reason this happens is that a lot of times salespeople get thrown out into the industry and they're told you got 30 days, 60 days, whatever, to well, prove yourself. And the good clients, the A plus clients, you don't move them necessarily in the first 30, 60, or 90 days. And uh, what happens is that these people, they start getting nervous because time is going fast and they need some results. This is a true story told to me by the guy that did it. He said, so I told this customer, yes, I can deliver your job in two weeks. And this client said, well, you can have the job if you can get it to me in two weeks. It was not a two-week job. It was a job that would take a minimum of four weeks, maybe five, just because of the complexity of it. And But he lied to the customer and they gave him the job. And then uh, the day before the job was supposed to be delivered, he phones the customer. It was a printing job, but same same thing applies in our industry. And he says to them, oh, he says, man, he said, um, we have an engineer in here and a bunch of mechanics, and they have our printing press taken apart. It's all over the floor in our um, plant. It broke, you know, in the night. And as soon as we fix this thing, uh, we'll, you know, get your job back on, and uh, and I'll call you and let you know when it comes. So the customer says, "Oh man, that's really unfortunate." So he hangs up the phone, and then what the sales guy didn't know is that the client knew someone who worked in the company. So he just put the phone down, then picked it up, dialed the number, called the plant, and he says, "Hey, uh, you know." Bill, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. He says, um, how are things going in the plant? He says, it's great. He says, oh man. He says, we're going gangbusters in here. We're like at 100% capacity. Everything he says, everything's good. Everything's good. Busted. And the reason this happens is that when people get themselves under pressure and they do una unethical things to get business, and it proves to be successful, they keep doing it because it worked. But your A-plus clients don't fall for that stuff. They understand that if you're honest, then it's reality and they will work together with you. So honesty and integrity will trump skills every single time. I want to thank you very, very much uh, for this. Uh,